Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. We are Alpha Quadrant 6, a science fiction review show. And on this episode, this is going to be fun. We decided to talk about space movies before Star Wars. BSW. BSW. Because <laughs> Star Wars was, let's face it, it was a game changer I mean, in terms of outer space, space opera kind of science fiction movies. Before that, there really wasn't a lot. In fact, we were trying to go through, like, what are all the really good space science fiction movies before Star Wars? And there were damn There was no, almost not, not a lot. Yeah. The, 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 well, wait. There, there's a lot of weird science fiction, like yeah. space-oriented movies, like bad ones. You know, it's always like, you know, they need women on Mars and weird stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> but right. Venus. The ones, Venus. as I went, I went through movies from the 50s forward. Yeah. And... First off, there was a ton of science fiction movies like I had never seen. There was a ton of science fiction movies. Nineteen fifties was like a golden age of science fiction, but there's not a lot of space movies. Yeah. And you're right when when they did go to space, it was almost always in, in our own solar system. Yeah. So I mean, nineteen fifty was a movie, Destination Moon, mm -hmm. and that kind of that was probably one of the best space movies of the time. Uh, and it was about go, you know the United States going to the moon, interestingly using mainly private industry, not government. Wow, you know, that's rocket. cool. Yeah. And it really was sort of setting the stage psychologically for the space race that yeah. was to come. Um, and then there were lots of fun, weird ones. And then most of the science fiction movies, though, were on Earth. You know, they yeah. were post-apocalyptic or futuristic or whatever. Mm. But now, Buck Rogers was going to, yeah, to Buck, other planets. Yeah, there but there were lots of aliens. They're all very campy and old Of course, but yeah. that, was the very, that was the very beginnings. The important thing about shows like Buck Rogers, though, is that they inspired the yes. next generation. Yes, sure. Which, you know, George Lucas was one of those people. You know, Absolutely. That, that's why there's the scroll in the beginning of Star yeah, yeah. Wars. This is before Star yeah, Wars. So, so we, the, we each wanted to pick just one space movie before Star Wars that we really liked that we wanted to talk about. Uh, and we'll go chronologically in terms of the movie. So, Bob, you're going to talk uh -huh. about Forbidden Planet. Forbidden Planet. I, I'm not a huge fan of 50s science fiction. I, I consume science fiction. I am science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. But, but 50s sci-fi was always like, ah, the special effects were bad. They were campy. It weren't, there was no hard science. Right. Give me a break. Yeah. Sometimes there's not a lot today. The techno babble but, was laughable. Right. Yeah, so it was, it was silly, but yeah. I just really, I've just fallen in love with Forbidden Planet. First off, we watched it with my dad growing up. Yeah. So it always, I always had a sweet spot for, for that. And compared to the other movies of, the, of its day, it is, for, I think it's far superior. I agree. It is, I think it's the best 50s iconic science fiction movie. Um, he, he has a story that when uh, color TV came out in the 50s, this was the only color TV show on at the time. And he watched it like dozens of times. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I had great memories watching with him. But it's such a wonderful show. It's so many, so many firsts. It was, let's see, the first faster than light craft carrying humans that they built themselves. Mm -hmm. First one. It was, let's see, there was some other firsts. It was. Was it first sentient robot? Nope. Well, well, the, it, Robbie the robot was a, it's another thing yeah. about, about this. He was he was not he was the first non tin can yeah. type of type of robot, mm -hmm. and he uh, to this day he's still. I mean, I own a Robbie the robot. It, oh, it's he's still, still it's still beautiful. Wonderful. It's still iconic. This get this this thing this prop cost in today's money one point one million dollars to make. Mm -hmm. They they put some effort and time yeah. and money into this. It, shows. it was the most expensive uh, prop for a movie. At that time, no other single prop mm -hmm. has ever been that expensive for a movie up until that. So, up until important that time. thing to note: Robbie was built for this movie. Absolutely, absolutely yeah. built for this movie. And, and uh, the cool thing about Robbie is that he appeared in tons of movies. Well, after then once that, they he, had him, I know they just yeah. kept, he kept popping up everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you would spend all this money on this prop after the movie. Like we're going to use him. He was in dozens, he was dozens, the robot. dozens yeah. of movies and, and TV shows. He sold for half a million dollars in 2017, the most expensive hero movie prop ever sold, mm -hmm. five and a half million dollars. Five and a half million. Five and a half, 5.3, 5 5.3 5 mm -hmm. million dollars. Wow, imagine, uh, having, not, Robbie not, the imagine having that. It was, and of course it brought, into, it's been compared to, uh, was it, was it a, uh, a, The Tempest? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, lot of similar, some similarities with, with Shakespeare's Tempest. The plot, yeah, yep. right. Um, so yeah, not for nothing, it's a really good story. Very oh, well made. Yeah, and good absolutely. science fiction, solid science and fiction. And you've got the Krell. You've yeah. got the Krell and their, their technology. I, I have a top 10 list of my favorite sci-fi technology of all time. And this technology is in the top five or maybe even the top three. The Krell technology used this, um, this underground series of fusion reactors, like thousands of fusion reactors. Didn't they also use the, I thought they were using uh, geothermal energy from the center of the planet. Yeah, I think he's right. 
Was it geothermal or just? They, I know that they were a lot of them were, were fusion. Yeah. Okay. There but was I fusion. Th I, yeah. I, th I seem to remember it being geothermal though. A lot of it, like they think it's energy from the core of the planet. Yeah. Don't you remember mm -hmm. that line? Now the in the array that they had that showed you the amount of energy yeah. that they were using. So there was like bank. I think the, it was a bank of gauges. It says banks upon banks upon banks, right? And each so one ten times is exponential. Yeah. Like ten times more power than the one than yeah. the previous. But the, their the technology. Imagine now the technology they envisioned. Um, was uh, being able to create from your mind any solid object anywhere on the planet. So this device could actually could actually like basically beam an object. I'm thinking of of a, a, I don't know a laptop computer or or my favorite Batmobile from the from yeah. the campy '60s Bat, Batman show, and it would like appear in front of you. That's I mean that's pretty. Uh, te technology doesn't get that advanced in many, yeah. in many It's like movies. the it's last machine it's, you'd ever need. Right, it's right. the last machine you would need. And of course, it, it, it famously created monsters from your unconscious, from your id, and that's what destroyed everybody. Well, no, <laughs> so, except, uh, so yeah, like the way I interpreted Morpheus. it was that while people were dreaming, the, the machine was still delivering to them what they wanted, mm -hmm. right? So that's why... Well, I think when, when Morpheus was dreaming, dreaming, but I think the Krell the were ship. smart enough that their subconscious could directly uh, use the machine. And so it was, even their waking subconscious was activating the machine. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, so that, that's it, cool. Now think about what happened in this story. This had such depth. Yeah. Like, uh, you had human colonists go to an alien planet, mm -hmm. they're colonizing it, and one of the scientists that was on the trip, Morbius, he finds the Krell technology. He, f he finds their underground energy system. He, mm -hmm. he starts to, he enhances his mind. He uses their technology to uplift himself. He creates Robbie, the ro Robbie the robot, yeah. the, a revolutionary bit of technology. Even for that science fiction time period mm -hmm. of humanity, Robbie was just like this, this, this amazing piece of, of, a, of techno, you know, right. utopian product that he made, he just tinkers it together. And I, think, I think Morbius said it was like a kid's toy to, to the Krell. So, so then the Krell, he d goes through the history of the Krell and he finds out that the Krell created this machine that would, would essentially let them manifest whatever they wanted, it, would be, it could become physical, right? So mm -hmm. they wanted food, they wanted, you know, they even, could... Even organic seeming uh, creatures, like, like, yeah. like animals, like lions and tigers mm -hmm. and, and things. It was really, really incredible. I remember the garden, remember Altair's garden? Mm -hmm. Some of that garden was from Wizard of Oz, Munchkin Land. They, they, oh, they, they, they were it. reusing stuff all the oh, time. Of course, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. this movie is the very first to have an all electronic score. Remember that score? Yeah. It's iconic. First movie to, to have that. It used and, a, um, what do you call it? Theremin? Theremin? Is it a theremin? Yeah, theremin. theremin. Yeah. And yeah. it was the first movie, oh, yeah. the first movie to take entirely take place, not on Earth, but on a separate planet, mm -hmm. other, other than Earth entirely. But still, the ship was a flight saucer. It was yeah. a flying saucer. But it was a but cool flying yeah, saucer. It, it was, was cool. but still, yeah, that's but that that's one of the things that makes the movie campy. Yeah. But still it's great. But yeah, so they And the name st stinks. C five three seven D or something. It was just like, yeah. come on, give it a real cool name. All right. Yeah. Like the, the Bellerophon. This is Morbius. This is a movie that cries out for a remake because it's a <sighs> great story. Yep. But the tech at the time was terrible. And there's so much room for improvement in but, every aspect all right, of it, production-wise. Right, special effects, I agree. A sequel, oh a my remake, God, why, remake. A remake, why isn't that... A prequel would be great, too. A prequel, yeah. right. Prequel but why, would be why, so cool. Wait, wait, you could have multiple prequels. Sure. You could have why prequel, haven't they, why hasn't done this? You this could have a prequel of ridiculous. what happened with the Krell. Then you could have a prequel of what Morbius did to right. all the other yeah. colonizers. Oh, my God, that's such a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, they got to do it. I mean, they're not looking back far enough, Steve. And I mean, think about it. You know, come on, we've seen this movie, uh, and I'm—I don't have a lot of tolerance for bad special effects. The special effects still kind of hold up, and they're still fun. Wow, they're not bad, when right? They, when, they're they're fighting, fighting, out of when they're fighting Morbius's <laughs> id, yeah. and it goes through that, the, the, the field, dragon and they're all like, shooting it. That lion-like lion monster. monster. Man, that that thing is really it impressive. Still holds the, up. The, the hand-drawn mm. thing that they did doesn't actually look cartoony. I, and I, I can argue that the effects were. Way beyond anything that came right. before it. It's I mean, like, yeah. like where did that come from? Like, wow, they really and it was nominated for for an award, Academy Award for best best special. Wow, events. and think about that. I mean, that is so uncommon even today, mm -hmm. for you know science fiction film to get nominated. Well, for it was it was not best picture, it was special effects. Special effects. Yeah, for special effects. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah. that's not that rare. Okay, um, okay. So let's move on. So. Um, Let's move ahead to my movie. So I want to talk about 2001, The Space yeah, Odyssey. Yeah, of course was, you want to talk about Of course about I do. That. <laughs> that was 1968. Your yep. movie was 1956, yep. right? So 56. we're going ahead a little bit more than a decade. Now remember, Steve, I'm going to interject here. You said that Star Wars was, was this milestone, iconic movie, yeah. and it was. But I would argue that, that 
this movie also, 2001, was also... Oh, absolutely. It, it was yeah. an anomaly, though. I think it was an anomaly. Yeah. Sure. Mid, I think late 60s. Forbidden Planet was a milestone. I yeah. think 2001 mm -hmm. was a milestone, and Star Wars was mm -hmm. a milestone. So 2001, you know, certainly took a giant leap forward in special effects in terms of being out in space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stanley Kubrick, the director, really made an effort to make it uh, very realistic, but it also fit what he was going for. He wanted space to be cold and lonely and quiet, yeah. and, quiet and alien. And just having no noise in space um, or having the classical music playing and, the, and, mm. the, and the, the scenes, like there were all these scenes that were slow and like methodical as the ships were moving and it was beautiful, but it also, you know, he was trying to convey like how long it takes to do everything in space. Yeah. You know, like everything was slow and tedious, but he made it into this beautiful dance and it worked so well on so many different levels. So, as Douglas Adams would say, a ballet of technology. Yes, <laughs> no, absolutely. So again, like Forbidden Planet, special effects leap ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No question. Excellent, um, unbelievable story. Um, and you know, just as science fiction, it's iconic. It's tremendous. I, again, I could go on a long time. About yes, you can. Let's, let's give a quick, quickie summary. So, yeah. and let me do it because I want to see how All well right. I, I can right. summarize your favorite movie by your favorite director. Yeah. So. There's these monkeys, you know, and the monkeys, <laughs> they, they fight. They can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they fight each They're other. They're monkeys. They, they hit a bone. A bone goes up in the air. It turns into a spaceship. That's how fast technology came. Just yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so, so into satellite. To get real, so the, the interesting takeaway for me from this movie was that the artificial intelligence, Hal, who mm. is, you know, very famous artificial intelligence, was he the first artificial intelligence conceptualized? That's a cool um, question. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, not that's not a robot. It's just an AI. Yeah, like a yeah. true AI. I think he is. I don't. I, I have no memory of an AI existing before Hal. Well, Colossus. Okay. All right. You got me there. Yeah. All right. So anyway, so Hal is the most human person <laughs> yeah. in the whole movie. Absolutely. And and at the end, you know, you know, everybody is super sterile, right? Mm -hmm. I remember a scene where the guy's calling up his daughter. He's on a spaceship and he's calling up his daughter, and it's her birthday. And it didn't feel right. It's awkward. It's, it's awkward. deliberately awkward. Yeah, yeah, you just feel like, why aren't you telling her you love her? Like the, the little girl. There was uh, no humanity there at all. Yeah. That was kind of the point that we were got, technology made us so disconnected from ourselves and from our family. Hey, and he from wasn't that off, man. I mean, if you think yeah, about it, Cooper. It's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, there's no emotion on the internet. <laughs> no, but you know, like, it's, it's in, you know the, the quick parallel to today is, you know, people are so into what's going on with, with their phone that there's not a lot of interpersonal. Mm -hmm. You know, interaction, which is sad. You know, like you want. I love it when my kids go outside and play, and when they interact yeah. with other people. But you do see a lot of teenagers, man, just pounding away on their phone. No, the best scene on the in the movie to represent that was when he has to go to the bathroom on the shuttle, and he's reading this wicked long list of instructions, like zero, how to use a zero G toilet. And he's like, reading through. Like he's never going to get a chance to go. Like a simple function like going to the bathroom is now impossibly complicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that is a good idea. Right. And then at the end when they're shutting Hal down, Daisy. yeah, Hal like Daisy. reverts back to almost like a childlike yeah. version of himself, and you actually feel bad for Hal at the end. And and what the thing is, the yeah. monolith did that to Hal, right? Didn't the the, the monolith corrupt Hal to, to push? No. We we were never given an explanation in two thousand and one. Two thousand ten. In two thousand and ten, they gave a cracky explanation. All right, so it wasn't even what Cooper wrote or what he what they would have originally wanted, right? It, there was just it was supposed to be a mystery. Like okay. we're not supposed to know why the computer went haywire. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. It's not. But the so there's a couple my couple of notes that I have about the movie. One, you're right, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little slow for my modern. Palette, yes. as far as the pacing goes. I think the pacing made a lot more sense to the uh, the audience of the, of his day. Yes. Although I, the only time I, f I love the, I think the pacing is luxurious, but you have to be in the mood to watch that kind of movie. The only time where I'm like, all right, this could be cut down was the end yes. sequence where yes, he's please. going through the lights. Okay, that was like 10 times as long as it needed to be to make his point. Yeah. But I do think at the time, that was like, look at these cool special effects. Yeah, yeah, I got And you. people were just mesmerized by the special effects, whereas today we're like, okay, we're done with the special Been effects. There, we don't, yeah, we yeah. don't need Been that. There, so, yeah. what, so Star Child, the Star Child was actually the, the, the evolved human. And yes. the monolith evolved that, yes. that character in That's the movie. That's the idea. Okay. It's all about transcendence. You know, yeah. We transcend from the you know, primitive primates to humans and then... The star child, you know, progresses beyond that. And the monolith represents what? 
What is it? Again, it's supposed to be a mystery, but you know, the idea is that it's some kind of an alien artifact that's involved in right. uplifting humans. But, but you know, we're not supposed to know, a, we're not supposed to fully wrap our head around and understand something that powerful, that advanced. That's also part of the movie. Like at the end sequence, when Kier Delay, you know, is um, in the room, right? Remember, he's like, now he's like in a, like mm -hmm. a, a, a mansion type of, of a house. Mm. And, he, and, he's, and he looks back to look at him, so like he's old. Yeah, what was with that? And he, so it's the idea that like when you evolve to a new stage, you can't really even relate to yourself in an earlier stage. Like, can you relate to seventeen-year-old Jay? Absolutely. Right no, but seriously, <laughs> no, no. like you really can't. Once you evolve beyond a certain yeah, point, you lose touch with your, your container early, gets bigger, and you yeah. can't put your head back into a smaller yeah. container. You just have to, you right. just, you know, it's all more of a mind. You trip. might intellectually be able to remember things about yourself. Like, you know, like if we we've talked about this, if we went back in time right now and tried to do some of the things we did when we were younger, we wouldn't enjoy it like we did then. It was magical to us then, but now. We're just different people. We have matured yeah. or whatever experience beyond that. New and different things are magical. Yeah, yeah. To that's us. true. But like, look at the point when you transcend to a new level, you really lose touch with your earlier level. I agree. You can't look back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a snake can't re, you know re wear its old skin. Yeah, right, right. But anyway, you it's get some a, crazy glue. Maybe you could kind of. It, it's it was a. But, uh, but why know. do you love it, Steve? This is what I've always wondered. I don't know. Why, that movie just, did it, something to you. Yeah, it's on every level. Even before I became a Kubrick fan, I just loved that movie. I, I do think because it's ineffable, because there's something about the movie, not only is it great science fiction, it's great storytelling, it's mesmerizing on, on multiple levels, there was something deeply mysterious about the movie that I thought was, was very engaging. And I think that was a point, you know, mm -hmm. to be deeply mysterious. That's why I kind of, in 2010, when they want to try to wrap everything up in a bow and explain exactly what yeah. happened, it kind of takes away from it, you know, yeah. that wasn't the purpose. Um, this is a great movie to to watch a like a making of and the, you yeah. know, there there are certain things that happened in this movie mm -hmm. where Kubrick was trying so hard to get space correctly mm -hmm. that I really appreciated. Now there's one special effect they did with the uh, the the pilot is asleep on the space cruiser and his pen is floating mm -hmm. in the cabin. And do you know how he pulled that that I know you know. Do you know how he pulled off the pen? Floating, there's no sure. They, they went on the the, uh, the vomit comet rocket, and they no. actually yeah. was actually low gravity. No, that's no? A, that's that's now what's funny is we, <laughs> it's you, Apollo yeah, 13. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, movies have been made on the vomit yeah. comet. Yeah. What he ended up doing was he he secured the pen to a pane of glass that was perfectly clean, and they rotated the glass. Mm -hmm. Right, so you can't see you can't see the rotation of the glass, so the pen just looks like it's floating in outer space, nice. and it was a really hard thing for them right. to conceptualize. And then there's one second when the when the stewardess comes by and picks it up, yeah. where it looks a little awkward for some reason. And I, and I remember, before I knew how they made the special yeah. effect, I remember watching the movie going, that was weird, how she, how she stopped the pen. She had to take the pen off the glass. She had to take the pen and pull it off the glass. And just the, her hand doing that just didn't seem like it would. Yeah. It would be more like she'd grab it like that. Yeah. But her hand couldn't break the plane of the glass. Right. Right. But it was still cool because it had that weird a feel to it that, mm. that went with the movie. Even it still that, works. Yeah, it still totally worked. But I just love... You know, Kubrick was a master movie maker, right? And he was a, he was of a time when the directors were innovating the special effects themselves, right. like Hitchcock. Like right. Hitchcock was, he was developing the how to make the special effects in his movie, and so was Kubrick. It wasn't like ILM, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't have ILM yeah. to call up and hey, do this for me. So that was Star Wars ten years later. That was Star Wars Kubrick 10 years was later. so good, though. Like a friend of his was doing the lights for what The Spy Who Loved Me, I think. One of the James Bond movies, it was the submarine that was mm -hmm. in the big submarine bay. I forget exactly what, 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 which James Bond movie it was. And the guy couldn't get the lighting right. And he called up Kubrick and said, can you come in and help me light this? And Cooper came in and lit the whole thing. Ah. And we're talking about a soundstage worth of lighting. Mm -hmm. He came in, lit the whole thing, and it worked. Yeah. That's how skilled Cooper was. Whoa, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, oh, yeah, he had it all, Bob. He, like Steve said, the directors back then were involved. They had mm -hmm. their hand on everything. So specialized now. Yeah. Well, it, it's good. But it needs, you, it yeah. needs to be. It, it, it does. Be a... I mean, you have people that are just, like, all they do is their one thing, and they do it you know, on an yeah. expert level. And it just makes everything happen faster and better. But it's right. just cool to look back and go, you know, he was acting kind of like an indie filmmaker mm -hmm. back in the day, you mm -hmm. know? I just really appreciate that about him. All right. And, and you guys read 3001? No. Yes, I did. I read a lot. I, read I liked it. I liked it. it. Yeah, the books it. were good. All, all right. right. I picked Planet of the Apes. Now, follow me. There is a spaceship... <laughs> It's it is an Earth-made Earth spaceship. There are astronauts. 
and they, they leave, and as far as we know, until, and now look, spoilers, come on, forget it, the movie was made in 1968 as well, so I'm going to just, just mm -hmm. say it. Um, they did return back to Earth. Yeah. They didn't know they were on Earth, so the whole Wait a minute, movie, Statue of Liberty. Yeah. <laughs> this is our planet! <laughs> Damn, you bastards! <laughs> um, so, uh, do you think South Park got you bastards from that movie? No. What a, what a great freaking movie. So anyway, I love Planet of the Apes. It's a great movie. It's it is barely a space movie, but you're right. That, but part of the problem was we couldn't come up with another great space movie pre-Star Wars. It That's shows right. you how rare they were, you know? We found three. We found 2.5, basically. Yeah. But, but this movie deserves to be on the list. What's, okay. what's great about this movie? Well, first, it's a really cool, unique story. Yeah. It's, it's the, the plot of this movie is so intensely interesting. I mean... And Charlton Heston really sells it. I mean, this is his best movie. Yeah. yeah. He's made a lot of good movies. He's made a lot of good movies, but he's kind of that one character. But this was like iconic Charlton Heston. Yeah, I mean, there's things that happen in this movie that, you know, when you... Get when your I, filthy paws, paws off me, you damn, damn dirty ape. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that line. It's that line, and then... Um, at the end, when the, the, that exposition, when they're yeah. riding on the beach, and he sees the uh, he sees the yeah. the uh, Statue, Statue of Liberty, of Liberty yeah. destroyed, melted. Yeah. You know, it's not just fallen over; it's been melted yeah, from yeah. a bomb. You know, you could tell, yeah. and he knew instantly. He put it together instantly. Yeah. But the yeah. movie the movie hits a a level of science fiction because of the immersion. You know, like mm -hmm. you have human actors inside very well crafted. You know, monkey ape costumes, at the time. Again, okay, now we look back and it's like, yeah, they were kind of cheesy. But at the time, that was really cutting edge technology. You know, oh, it was prosthetics it was, and makeup. Sure. Basically right. immersive. It's still good today. It still, look, yeah, it it still looks. looks good. You know, come on. We have, of course, we have the, the, with digital effects. We have it looks seamless. Like you actually think it's you know yeah. an uplifted uh, oh. chimp or whatever. And they're good movies but, too. But you know, because their mouths didn't couldn't articulate. It was yeah, just yeah. open and closed. But the actors underneath did such a good job. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about Dr. Cornelius and. Uh. and Dr. Zayas and all, you know, yeah. what was his wife's name? She was amazing. I, I think yeah. she did the best job. They had, they had, you know, affectations that, that the uh, actors yeah. built in. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the big apes. That oh, were, her the, best line is from Return from the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, the Return, what was it? Where she builds the, uh, she solves the puzzle they gave for us. Yeah. Now she's a captive in the human cage, right? Yeah, she's Remember time traveled to the past. Yeah, she's in the past, and she she solves the puzzle that they put there for. But it's supposed to like build stairs to get to a banana. So then she does it, and then just sits there and looks at the banana. And it's like, why isn't she taking the banana? And this is her first line, the first yeah. time they hear. She says, "Because I loathe bananas." <laughs> <laughs> like cooking out her mouth. Oh, I gotta so watch like, oh, that again. God. That was her damn dirty April. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, even even the prequel, even like the prequel movies that they made after Planet of the Apes weren't bad. They they, they yeah. held they held up. Some you know of them. Yeah. You know, I, I, you they know. got progressively cheesy, they, but they did. They, Planet of the Apes was the, the first one was the best one, and then it was just money grab sequels. Some of them were not bad, but um, and some were terrible. But overall, you know, the movie does hold up. Yeah. It still has its important moments. You still feel everything that's happening. I love the idea that we are seeing a genuinely different culture. And we're seeing, like, I love the scene where, I think it was Dr. Zayas is trying to interpret the artifacts left behind by the humans, yeah, remember? And it, it totally has no idea. Yeah. Um, and I love that when they're in court and, and, oh, yeah. and Charles Heston is going off. And the three the three judges do they hear yeah, oh they, you know, they see no evil speak no evil yeah, they, saw, they, yeah, they see a yeah. statue and they think it's an ancient artifact right, like right. You know. it's just lots of clever little touches in the movie oh Very absolutely well it was now how freaky was it when you see um, one of Charlton Heston's uh, Taylor's shipmates yeah. in the museum he was stuffed in the museum yeah like uh, there With was a, a wicked little scar from a yeah lobotomy where he was lobotomized there was Ooh. a um, there's an ape. In uh, one of the museums in New York City, the, the mm. Natural History Museum in New York City. He's got City. the horseshoe scar too. No, he doesn't. Yeah. No, but you could. It's a it's a, a gorilla, yeah. and you could see the bullet holes, right? Because I don't know why they didn't glue ape fur over those holes, but you could. You know, I had someone point them out Maybe. to me. You could see them on a lot of the animals. Yeah, they wanted where, where they, to. Leave them I mean, in there. and it just totally remind. I, I really do think that the person that wrote that bit like saw that. Sure, ape that's in the, the whole museum. point. And the whole point was, yeah, that now the roles are reversed, and we're still, like we're doing to. They were doing to us what we were doing to animals, right. and we get it from a different point of view. Yeah. So yeah. overall, I think you know, for a 1968 movie, the movie today is 50 years old. The movie, the movie is is great. It's a good, you know, it's actually good for you know young adults to watch because mm -hmm. there's there's, yeah. some, there's 
ideas in the movie that are good for them to understand, something that you can have a conversation with people about. Um, but, you know, the, thing, the big difference between movies today and movies back then, other than there's a lot of things that are different, right? So the pacing in most of these mm -hmm. movies is going to be a lot slower. Hell, E.T. has a horribly slow pacing, yeah, right? Oh, my God. It's, all, it's damn near unwatchable. I saw it in 2003 with my daughter, and I was in shock. Like, what happened? What happened? What's wrong with the movie? Yeah, it's like, it's we're broken. just waiting for stuff to happen. And I had seen it in 81, like 20, 20 years earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we loved and it. It was but the this, movie but, of the, I mean, the whole world was in love with yeah. this movie. But the three movies you later, talked about hold, hold up, up though. They're, yeah, well, that, yes. I think part of it is they, Some movies just hold up. Yeah. But no, but, I, but I, I think this is a really good point that we should go over. There is something to be said about pacing and how it translates into a modern audience. And absolutely, even the absolutely. movie that I that I say is one, has one of the slowest pacings of all movies is 2001. Mm -hmm. It's still an amazingly compelling movie yeah. because, because the pacing is part of the storytelling yes. and, and, and like right, it is right. in every movie. But you know, they thought that Planet of the Apes for its time was a relatively quick-paced movie and the pacing completely holds up. The pacing in uh, in um, Forbidden Planet. The pacing in Forbidden Planet is a little slow for my modern palate, but it actually holds up. It, it doesn't does. annoy me. You know, because you, you, the thing that you don't want to have happen is when you're like, God, why isn't it okay already? Get on to the next scene. Yeah. Right? These See, movies I think don't do that. If you're a good director, then that kind of transcends yeah. time. Which you is, know, which is very and you can see like when you watch an '80s movie by an average director, it's an '80s movie, right? Yeah. But when you watch an '80s movie by a great director, it's not an '80s movie. It's a movie by that director. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. That's the difference. And what the, the, as you say, the pacing is part of the art. And if you're just sort of following along with the, the what's typically done at that time, then then it gets dated very quickly. Mm -hmm. But if it's a really a work of art, like I think these all these three movies are, they totally hold up over time. Yeah. So, of course, we recommend you guys, if you haven't seen these movies, give them a shot. And we would love to hear what you think about them, especially Planet of the Apes, because that's the one that I talked about. Yeah. Or if there's other <laughs> movies from pre-Star Wars. These are space movies before Star Wars uh, that we didn't talk about that you think should have been on the list. Let us know. But also, I think we should do more of these retrospectives of, of, of other types of science fiction movies as well. There are some gems out there. And when, you know, when you're between uh, HBO series like Game of Thrones or whatnot, you need to binge something or you need something to watch, going back and streaming some of these old science fiction movies is great. I like watching them with my daughters and seeing which movies hold up. Like sometimes I'm like seeing a movie for the first time in 20 or 30 yeah. years, uh, like Total Recall. Yeah. It's hard wow. to predict. Does not hold up. It like, didn't hold it up. It was yeah. a great movie at the time. Like, yeah, this is really terrible. <laughs> but other movies like 2001 or you know, Forbidden Planet or, or Planet of the Apes completely hold up over time. Do you guys think that Logan's Run holds up? We, all right, so I, do, I very recently watched that with my daughters and it sort of holds yeah. up. It sort of held yeah. up. It sort of held up. Yeah. You have to give it a sort of because some of the aspects of it are cheesy. Um, you know, but like, it did. It's, like, it wasn't, that's, but it was like, enjoyable to watch. Time Pulling. for a remake. Prime, what, absolutely what an prime awesome story. They've and, tried and, over and over. Yeah, it just I know. It never just comes together. It doesn't fully come together. Um, okay, so guys, we're Alpha Quadrant 6. If you enjoy the show, you can go to Alpha Quadrant and the number 6.com and you can see everything that we do. We're on YouTube, we have a Patreon if you want to help support the show, and of course, we have a Facebook page where we put our Star Trek live streams. So please check us out, and we'll see you again very soon. Mm -hmm.